You will hear a manager from an engineering company talking to a group of new trainees. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Ah, good morning, everyone. My name's Jeremy Armstrong, and I'm in charge of your training program here at Coppersmith Engineering, manufacturers of what we like to think are the world's best diesel engines. I'll start by giving you a very brief background to the company. Right. Now, the founder, John Coppersmith, was born locally in 1910. In 1932, he started making bicycles in a shed at the bottom of his garden. This proved so successful that two years later, he rented a small factory unit and set up Coppersmith Engineering. So we date back to 1934, and since then, we've produced over 10 million engines. As you probably know, the engines we manufacture are not for cars, but for vehicles used in industry and agriculture. In the last few years, we've also made engines that are used to power boats, including police launches and lifeboats. Another fairly new development is that ten years ago we set up a joint venture with a Japanese manufacturer, and as a result, we're seeing a big rise in turnover. While keeping production costs steady, of course, this success gives us great confidence in the future, and so we're currently in the middle of a five-year plan to improve the buildings we have here. We've just completed a new test facility, and、uh, as you were coming in, you probably noticed the site where we're constructing an office block. At present, our desk-based staff are in several buildings, and they're all due to move into the new one. In six months' time. Oh, and、uh, just one more point I'd like to mention: our goal has always been to achieve top quality in everything we do. So, when we received an award last month from the city council, naming us best employer, we were very proud indeed. Before you hear the rest of what the manager has to say. You have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Okay, now I'll give you an idea of what to expect in the next few days. You'll each be spending today and tomorrow with one of our staff, following him or her around, sitting in on meetings, and generally learning about that particular activity. Now, this is how I've allocated you,、uh, Carol. You said in your interview that you're interested in finance, so I've put you with a person who deals with payments to staff. This is the busiest week in the monthly cycle, as all the overtime has to be calculated before payday. Now, Frank, I believe you've already had some training in sales, and you want to look at the process from the other side. So the purchasing section is where you'll start off. You'll be able to find out how we buy goods and services from our suppliers. Next on the list is Philip. You said you hope to work in advertising, so I had arranged for you to work alongside our marketing manager, but I'm afraid she's on sick leave at the moment, 
So instead, you'll be with someone who deals with sales to other countries. As you speak two or three languages, you should find you can use them. Stephanie, you didn't mention any preference, so I've put you with a warehouse manager. We purchase goods almost every day and have frequent deliveries, so you'll see how we handle all the goods that come in. And not to mention the finished products waiting to be dispatched to customers. And lastly, Min, I understand you've been working in an employment agency and would like to look at the application process from an employer's point of view. We're about to advertise for new training staff to join my section, so you'll be with the person who's responsible for recruiting them. You might have some good ideas for how they should go about it. OK, now, if you'd like to come this way... I'll... That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear the Master of a University Hall of Residence giving a short introductory talk to new students at the University Hall of Residence. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the short introductory talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Chelston Hall of Residence. My name is Dr Frank Jones and I am the Master of Chelston Hall. As you all know, you are all attending Wesley University to study different courses and Chelston Hall of Residence will be your home for the first year of your studies. You are all first-year students as Chelston offers accommodation only to first-year students at the University. In this short talk, I'm going to go through some of the things you ought to know about life in the Hall. I will also go through some rules so that we can all live together in a satisfactory way for the whole year. First of all, I would like to go through the eating arrangements. Chelston Hall offers full board accommodation so there will be breakfast and dinner every day with lunch also available at weekends. You are not obliged to go to the meals but they will be there if you wish to take advantage of them. In fact it would be a waste of money not to as you are paying for the food in your hall fees. The times of the meals are as follows. Breakfast is served from 7am to 8.30am every day though these times are an hour later at weekends. Dinner is served at 6.30pm to 7.45pm, seven days a week. On Saturday and Sunday, lunch is served at 12.30pm to 1.45pm. If you are late, then you will not get any food. Once the hatches are closed in the dining hall, they stay closed. The dining hall is cafeteria-style service and there is always a selection of food for vegetarians. If there are a lot of people at the dining hall, then please queue up in an orderly manner and wait your turn. Please do not push into the queue. At the end of your meal, please take your tray over to the side tables and put your dirty plates and utensils in the appropriate places. We do have kitchen staff, but they are not your servants and we expect you to take your own dishes and cutlery off the table. Rudeness and incivility to the staff will also not be tolerated. 
Each evening after dinner there will be coffee and tea available in the common room until 9.30. Again, please do not leave cups lying around, but put the dirty ones back on the trays provided. The coffee service will be discontinued if the common room becomes an untidy tip. Other facilities that we have here on site are a TV room and a self-service laundry. The TV room has one set which can receive the regular channels but no satellite channels. The laundry room has eight washing machines and eight dryers. These are all coin operated. You will need one pound in two fifty pence pieces for one wash. The dryers take twenty pence pieces and will run for fifteen minutes on one twenty pence piece. We recommend that you buy a box of washing detergent at the local supermarket but you can buy individual packets of washing powder from a vending machine, provided it has not run out. One individual box from the machine is good for one wash. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the short introductory talk and answer questions 16 to 20. As you will know by now, the hall is divided up into corridors with six rooms attached to each corridor. Each corridor has shower compartments, one bath and a kitchen. We have cleaners who clean up the corridors and bathrooms, but the cleaners are not responsible for cleaning the kitchens. So, if you want to cook something in addition to the food we provide, then please clean up your dirty pans and plates yourself. If any kitchen gets into too bad a state, then it will be closed and locked up for the remainder of the term. Any dirty dishes or pans that are in the kitchen will just be thrown out. By the way, as you will also know, the corridors are co-ed, so you will need a reasonable amount of consideration and modesty moving around to the bathrooms and back. Another important issue is our fire drill. Please make sure that you have read the notice which is in every corridor about what to do if there is a fire. It is very important that you know where your nearest fire exit is and where to go when you get out of the building. For example, if you are in block A, there are two exits and not everyone should exit from just one of these. The assembly point for both blocks is the car park where your block leader will take a roll call to make sure no one is left inside. We are obliged by the fire service to perform two emergency practices every year. Please take them seriously, as if they are not done well, then we shall have three or four or five practices, or however many it takes to get it right. Finally, we have the issue of noise. For a lot of you, this will be the first time not living at home with your family, and you will have access to lots of friends your own age, and alcohol. I must urge you at all times to try and behave with consideration to your fellow hall tenants at all times. Don't play your music too loudly, or make too much noise at any time, and especially at night. People around you all the time will be trying to work, sleep, or just relax. Have fun, but think of others. We take quite a strict attitude to those who end up annoying everyone else. If you are found to be disturbing others in the hall to an unreasonable amount, you will be warned and if the problem persists, you will be asked to leave. You will not receive any refund of the funds you have paid. I hope that I have not unduly worried anyone. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear two students discussing their project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, Fred, thanks for coming over to my room. Oh, that's OK. I had a lecture near here this morning, so it was easy to come over. We've got to get on with this North Sea oil project anyway. So, did you manage to do any of the things that we decided last week? Most of the things. I got all the books from the library and saw Mr Peters about the research. He told me the names of some good sites on the internet where I could find lots of information about the North Sea oil industry safety issues. He's a great tutor, isn't he? Yes, he is. So I checked out the sites and made some notes. What about you? Did you get the information on the background and history of the North Sea oil industry? Yeah, there were loads of information and I've made notes too. I think I've got it all covered. So let me tell you what I've found out. I'll run the ideas past you and you can tell me if it's OK. Good idea. So, as you know, the North Sea lies to the east and northeast of England and Scotland. Apparently, the North Sea was long dismissed as a potential source of oil or gas. But over the last four decades, it has become the centre of one of the world's most productive energy industries. Gas was actually first found in quantity in the Groningen area of the Netherlands in 1959. This was followed by the first British discovery of gas in the West Sole Field, off the coast of East Anglia, by the BP drilling rig Seagem late in 1965. Actually, the first accident was on that rig too. Anyway, sorry. Go on, Judith. The British oil and gas industry in the southern North Sea grew rapidly in the early years. The deepening economic crisis in the UK meant that there was enormous pressure on the industry to get gas and later oil flowing. As exploration and investment moved further north, it became clear that there was oil to be found in great quantities. Discoveries of oil grew in number as more companies, British, European and American, took out leases on sectors of the North Sea. During the 1990s, like the rest of the world, the North Sea industry was badly affected by the global price fluctuations. Nevertheless, production grew and peaked around 2000-2001. Now, the North Sea is regarded as a mature province on a slow decline. That's about it for now. I'll put more detail into it when we do the presentation. You know, statistics and all that. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Yes, you've done a good job. Shall I do the same then? It's not as long as yours. Go ahead. OK then. As I said earlier, the first industrial accident related to the industry in the North Sea happened only days after they discovered the first gas. The sea gem capsized with the loss of 13 lives. There are regular accidents on all oil rigs around the world, but the North Sea is just such a harsh environment that there always seems to be more there. The most famous accident, and the worst disaster in the North Sea, was in the Piper Alpha disaster of 1988. Yes, I remember that one on the news when it happened. 
Today, the industry is very safety conscious. When you first arrive, you are given a safety tour of the installation, detailing all safety aspects, including fire extinguishers, emergency muster stations, lifeboat stations and emergency procedures. You will be introduced to the RIG safety programme. Everyone attends weekly safety meetings and daily pre-tour meetings. The weekly meeting is an in-depth look at industry-wide safety news and other safety-related issues on the RIG. Companies share safety information with other companies throughout the industry. This helps to avoid repeated incidents. A fire and boat drill is often held on the same day which involves a mock fire and a mock abandon the rig exercise. The pre-tour meeting is usually a description of the work carried out when you are off shift. The work you will be doing, the work others are currently doing that may affect you and any other relevant issues of the day. Accidents do still happen as in every industry. However, Statistics show that with the massive improvements in offshore safety procedures, you now have a higher chance of having fatal accidents if you work on a building site than you do when on an oil rig. Well, that's all from me. I'll add lots of details too. OK, well let's plan what we have to do next. That is the end of Section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of an advertising lecture. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. Today's advertising lecture is on the history and development of highway billboards and their effectiveness. Later on we will look at their design and different uses. The roots of billboard advertising can be traced to the invention of movable type printing by Johannes Gutenberg as far back as 1450 and advertising in the modern sense was launched in the form of the handbill. When the lithographic process was perfected in 1796, the illustrated poster became a reality. Gradually, measures were taken to ensure exposure of a message for a fixed period of time. In order to offer more desirable locations where traffic was heavy, bill posters began to erect their own structures. In 1835, the large American outdoor poster, more than 50 square feet, originated in New York in Jared Bell's office where he printed posters for the circus. In 1900 a standardised billboard structure was created in America and ushered in a boom in national billboard campaigns. There are a number of reasons for the recent surge in billboard advertising, not the least of which is cost efficiency. Compared to other forms of advertising, Billboards are a relatively inexpensive way to get your point across to the general public. Consider this. A newspaper ad is only good for a day, and a television commercial only lasts about 30 seconds. But a billboard ad is working for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The cost of billboard advertising ranges from about $700 to $2,500 a month. At that rate, 10 billboards could run for as much as $25,000 per month. That sounds like a lot of money until you realise that a full-page ad running for one day in a major newspaper 
costs about the same. So billboard advertising can be an effective and cost efficient way for entrepreneurs to spread the word about their products and services. The Outdoor Advertising Association of America estimates that US businesses spent more than $5.5 billion on outdoor advertising last year and the association is anticipating a healthy increase over the next few years. Advances in technology have also contributed to billboard advertising's cost efficiency. In the past, billboards had to be hand-painted, a time-consuming and costly venture. But with today's computer technology, billboards are designed on a computer screen, printed to vinyl or poster paper, and glued to the billboard structure. The result is higher quality ads in less time for less money. Let's look now at a famous example. In 1925, Alan O'Dell, who owned a small company that made a brushless shaving cream, noticed that gas stations and other local businesses were increasing trade by putting up advertising signs along the nation's highways. He decided that he could increase his sales by putting up sets of signs. Five in a set. They would not have to be big, and a short line on each one would do. At first, Odell tried the hard sell approach. Sales began to increase at once, but that did not satisfy him. Motorists see these signs, he told himself, at remote places on the highway. Perhaps after hours of monotonous driving, they would appreciate a touch of rhyme and humour. They would indeed. It was not long before the catchy Burma shave signs, some ironic, some cynical, some absurd, but all of them funny, caught the fancy of nearly everyone, including those people usually critical of advertising. These signs continued as the advertising medium of the company for 35 years, and then, when cars travelled too fast to take in these messages, more than a dozen words painted in rather small letters, the company phased out its roadside advertising. Perhaps a growing criticism of this sort of advertising, which interfered with highway scenery, also influenced the company's decision. By late 1965, this criticism resulted in President Lyndon Johnson's Highway Beautification Bill. This bill authorised a federal state campaign to improve the scenery on either side of major highways to conceal or remove junkyards and to put billboards sufficiently far back from the highway so that they would not interfere with the view. States that did not comply with the bill could lose 10% of their federal highway grant. But this was not the end of the billboard industry. Many roads were not part of the highway system which was supported by federal grants, and these roads were not affected by the law, and nor were signs in commercial and industrial areas. Now let's look at some of the advertising developments in Europe. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.